Our next uh, topic are the ENT manifestations of Down syndrome by Dr. Mohan Kameshwaran. He uh, needs no introduction to anyone in India or abroad, I think. He's like a living legend in ENT, field of ENT, uh, with special interest in children with Downs. First of all, good morning to you. Uh, let me tell you how privileged and, and happy I feel to be here with all of you this morning. Uh, Dr. Ramchandran actually wanted me to emphasize on some of the aspects of ENT problems. I think perhaps because it's not been um, highlighted enough uh, in my opinion and a lot of issues uh, are very, very common in, in Down's babies. So I think uh, I'll share with you some of the uh, aspects. It's a huge list actually but we'll talk about some of the more important issues and then at the end of the day I mean, end of the talk, we can have time for discussions if, uh, if required. Of course, we're all talking about Downs, so we know what it is, but there are a lot of morphological issues which predispose to ENT problems. First of all, let's take the ear, and this is a most commonly talked about aspect. Almost half of Down syndrome babies have very narrow ear canals. And one of the most common uh, issues that they face is accumulation of wax. It's a very simple problem. You must remember that wax or cerumen, as we call it, is a normal secretion of the human body. And it, in fact, has a protective role in all of us. But when the, the normal mechanism of the ear is that the cerumen is secreted in the outer part of the ear, the skin of the outer part of the ear is very peculiar skin. It's a very unusual as a skin in the whole body because it tends to migrate. It slowly moves from inside out. And it carries the cerumen or in fact any dead skin or anything of that sort, slowly comes out and it falls out. In fact, when we actually start cleaning it, when we start using let's say earbuds to clean, what we do is we exactly work opposite to it. We push it in more. And this tends to collect the wax. And over time it hardens and it just becomes very, very hard, almost like a piece of stone inside the ear. It's very painful because the ear skin is one of the most delicate, most sensitive parts of the skin in the body. So it's very, very tender. And also, it, it's very hard to remove at the stage. Sometimes you may even have to give a little anesthesia for the child to clear it. So, what I'm trying to say is, do not go and mechanically clean the ear. You can clean the outer part of the ear, but don't go digging into the ear. You know, because a lot of parents have this, uh, you know, thought that this is uh, dirt in the ear. It's, it's not dirt. It is just normal secretion of the human body. So, when the ear canal becomes very narrow, this becomes a very important issue because it then tends to, you know, have a bigger tendency to collect. And this is a very, very practical problem because if the ear is fully blocked with wax, you have something like 25 to 30 decibel hearing loss, which is roughly equivalent to, a, you know, a person talking in a soft voice. So, practically, you know, they start having a, a subtle hearing loss. So, we will see why it's important later. But this is a very, very simple day-to-day -day issue which many parents... Uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, dissolvents, solvents which you can... Uh, ear drops which you can use to dissolve it. But even if you dissolve it, you know, if you go digging in again, again it's the same issue. So, you know, you can use the drops to soften the wax, but let it come out and then clean it outside the ear, but not inside the ear. The outer part of the ear that is visible outside is called as the pinna. <clears throat> in fact, it's a very uh, interesting organ because in, in humans, it is what we call atavistic. That is, it is becoming more and more regressive in function for us. In the animals, they have a more important function. For example, if you see a cat, you know, if a cat is there or a dog is there, and if you make a sound, you will see that the ear is turning, you know, to the, it's called prayer's reflex. So the purpose of the ear turning is to focus so that the sound energy is collected better. 
But in us, in humans, we have lost the ability to move the ear, you know. So, we are actually regressing, you know, evolutionarily as far as the ear is concerned, the outer ear is concerned. But nevertheless, the ear is very important because of the conical shape of the outer ear, it tends to collect sounds in both ears. And there is a very subtle difference in the timing or what we call the phase of the sound which hits the two ears. So if you are turning your head a bit and the sound is coming from here, it reaches this ear a fraction of a millisecond before it reaches the other ear and there's a subtle phase difference. This phase difference is calculated by the brain and immediately the brain says he is 30 degrees west or 25 degrees north. So you know where the… So in other words, the directionality of sound, where is it coming from? You need both ears and you need both ears to be collecting sound. So this external ear or the pinna tends to become smaller even in Down's babies. In fact, it's, uh, we say it's two standard deviations below normal. So this can interfere with sound localization. So babies can have problems in finding out from which direction the sound is coming. So this is a very subtle problem which parents may notice over a period of time, but it can be a, a genuine issue. Now going into the ear, the ear drum itself is, is a little unusual in texture. The ear drum is a marvel actually because it's a, it's a three-layered structure and it's uh, so formed that even in very low energy sounds can cause the vibration of it. And this is amplified and then fed into the inner ear and then onto the brain. So the ear drum has to be the correct texture to vibrate and then to pick up the sounds. And that's how we hear. Now in Down syndrome, the problem is that these three layers, the middle layer, which is an important layer, tends to be very sparse or very uh, thin. And therefore, the, the texture may change in Down syndrome. And this may lead to a very subtle hearing loss in about 10, 15 percent. And, and this uh, can also be an issue in otherwise normal children, you know, otherwise normal Down's babies. This can also lead to a subtle hearing loss. Now, if you look at the hear overall prevalence of hearing loss in Down's babies, it's pretty alarming actually. It's about almost, uh, you know, from, if you look at the different literature, it, there's a range from something like 30, 35 percent to almost uh, three-fourths. So this is huge because if you take normal children, in, in or so-called normal children in schools, and you analyze their hearing, the normal average uh, prevalence of hearing loss is around two to three percent. Two and a half percent, it is, but two to three percent. But this uh, in Down's babies becomes so much more common for various reasons. We'll talk about it. It can be almost uh, 25 to 30 times more common than in normal children. Now, why is hearing important? Now, it's very important because it's been emphasized again and again. Hearing is not only the what is the function of hearing. Okay, let's have go to a very fundamental level. The function of hearing is not to only listen to boring lectures like this, you know, it's more than that. <laughs> Supposing you're sitting here and there is a, a sudden, let's say, discordant sound, you know, an, an, an unusual sound. I can bet you within two minutes the hall will be empty, right? That's the purpose of hearing. That's the most important purpose of hearing. The most important purpose of hearing is to safeguard or safety or safeguard of human life or whatever life. So it's very interesting because if you take natural disasters, for example, we had a tsunami in, in Chennai in about, let's say, some 12, 13 years ago. It is interesting that the only lives lost were humans and domestic animals, okay? No wild animal, no rat died in the tsunami. Why is that? Because preceding the tsunami is an infrasound, which is, what is infrasound? It's below the range that we can hear. We can't hear it. 
but animals can hear it and they run the moment they hear the low frequency sound. The same thing happens with earthquakes. In Pompeii in Italy, I don't know if many of you, how many of you have visited this place, Mount Vesuvius, it's an volcano, erupted about 1,000, 1,200 years ago. And in a fraction of a second, the entire Pompeii city was frozen in ash. Okay? So this is interesting to us now because it's a time capsule. We can go and, you know, excavate and see what is, you know, how people lived, what kind of houses they had, what kind of uh, lifestyle they had, how did they cook, and what is the kitchen like, what is the drawing hall like. They had gym, they had spa, they had everything. But what's again interesting is that you only found humans and the faithful domestic dog. You never found a cat, you never found a rat, you never found any other animal in Pompeii. Again, the purpose of sound hearing is safeguarding life. This becomes very interesting to us now when we are in a situation where we can now give back hearing to children who have lost hearing. Okay, I will talk about it later, but there's a technology now which we uh, have uh, called a cochlear implant where we can actually give a, a profoundly deaf child normal hearing. Now, I had this little baby who was about six months old who had profound hearing loss. And, uh, you know, the mother, father, they were all disaster, it was devastated, they came crying. We said, okay, fine, uh, don't worry, you know, we'll sort it out. So we gave the baby a cochlear implant, uh, in fact, for both years, the baby started hearing, you know, we were resuscitating, and I mean, we started getting uh, back to habilitation and, you know, getting uh, on. When the baby was uh, one year old, the mother and father came along with the grandparents uh, and, you know, they were so happy, they were bringing sweets and distributing to all the staff in the hospital, all the patients who were coming and everyone. And then I, I just asked the mother, how is the baby? And you know what she said? She said, sir, she's doing very well, but when she wakes up at night for her bottle, she first puts the implant and then takes the bottle, right? So that you know, is an education for me because again, re you know, enforces the fact that the baby is connecting with the environment and then fulfilling his needs. Okay, so this is the most important aspect of hearing. Now, hearing is also very important for cognitive development. In fact, at every age, it's not only in babies. Believe me, it's at all age, you know. In fact, in the elderly, it's an even bigger issue. Because if you see elderly people who are losing hearing and who don't correct it, they are the ones who go rapidly for cognitive decline. You know, go for Alzheimer's, they go for memory loss and everything. Similarly, in, in the time of, uh, you know, uh, the development of the baby in utero, the first sense which the baby develops in utero is hearing. And in fact, the very last sense that we lose when we die is also hearing. In utero, what happens is the brain is developing at a rapid pace, especially in the, in the, you know, the second half, it's just exploding. You are throwing out millions and millions of neurons and these neurons are all rapidly expanding and connecting with each other and they're forming what is known as synapses. Very sobering thought that the number of synapses that the human brain has produced at birth is more than all the objects in the known universe. It's more than a trillion synapses. Trillions. Not billions, you know, it's trillions. And then as the child starts developing outside, this profound or profuse proliferation of synapses and neurons slowly starts cutting down. This is known as synaptic pruning. So whatever is not required, the brain say, you know, slowly says, okay, it's not required, so let's cut it down. These circuits are all very important, let's reinforce it. So there's a lot of reorganization going on, and this happens especially in the first year of life. And for this, the most important sense is hearing, which is why we keep on saying, you know, even 
uh, Dr. Archana said the same thing, do not show visual objects, do not show computers, do not show television, do not show this. Keep flooding the ear and the brain with sounds, with hearing. So that you are optimizing the circuits in the brain, you are reinforcing the circuits which are required and you are making the central nervous system into an optimal functioning system. So for cognitive development, the important sense is hearing. And obviously, you know, that goes on into development of the mind, development of uh, the language and learning and so on, so everything. The moment you say cognitive development includes everything. So, hearing is very, very crucial, especially in the earlier part of life. We all talk about neural plasticity. That is, the brain is plastic. It's plastic because it has the ability to learn. And this plasticity gradually fades off as we get older. Obviously, you know, the younger ones uh, are much quicker in picking up a new thing than, you know, and as you get to my old age, you know, you start slowly, you know, start uh, floundering around. Even what you know seems to be a, a big task also, slowly going down. But the plasticity continues throughout life, but it's phenomenal when you're young. And this plasticity is, has to be taken advantage of in the earlier part of the brain development and particularly for that, the hearing again becomes crucial. So, in Down syndrome, just coming back to the topic, we have stenotic ear canals, we already said that in about half the children, the ear canal is narrow. There is a, a hyperplasia of the middle of the face and this means that the tube which connects the nose or the back of the nose with the ear, middle ear, which is responsible for the pressure equalization in the middle ear, tends to be also very, very small, it's narrow, it can collapse easily. And this leads to a lot of middle ear fluid collection, middle ear infections and so on. And overall, the immune system is also depressed in these children. So all this leads to what is known as otitis media. Now, on the left side, you all see a perforation. So this is a, a, a eardrum, very angry looking, reddish, middle ear mucosa and a hole from which has been made for the pus to come out. So this is a, a drum which is perforated. Now if it's an acute infection, the human body has tremendous tendency to heal. After all, the human body is the only machine in the world which can repair itself, isn't it? If you think about it, it's the only machine and we take it for granted. But this perforation will heal Surprisingly, even if it's very big perforation, it will heal in majority of children, an acute infection. But if it becomes a chronic infection, which means more than a month or repeated infections, then this can stay put. This is what we call a permanent perforation syndrome or a permanent hole. Now, this will lead to a hearing loss, obviously. And you know, we may need to correct it because surgically we may have to correct it. Now here on the right side, this looks even nastier. That's the eardrum. That's the ear canal. And you see this little blackish, brownish, grayish stuff. This is known as a cholesteatoma. It's a, a very serious infection because it's an infection going from the outer ear through the drum and going on to the bone around the ear. And it tends to invade. It tends to eat away the bone and spread slowly. The tragedy is, it's absolutely silent, it's painless. And the only symptom may be a very thin ear discharge occasionally, which is very foul smelling, or occasionally a hearing loss. Even that can be quite late. But this can spread in the bone, eat away the bone and go on. And eventually, since the bone around the ear is the base of the brain, it can eventually go and attack the brain and can even lead to complications in the brain. So it's a serious illness, it's a serious infection. And one has to be very, very you know, alert about it. And usually it's picked up when the child is brought for some other condition. Like say, the parents will come saying, the child has got you know, repeated colds, cough, is not the same. And we look into the ear and we then pick up a, a cholesterol. And say, my God, you know, this is more important. Forget about the cold. 
nobody is going to die from a cold, but this can be a, a serious problem. So this is something that is picked up by screening of the child regularly. <coughs> so hearing impairment can be subtle. You know, if you do 25 to 30 percent hearing loss, you may easily miss it, easily miss it. Which is why even people who have significant hearing loss, you know, somebody may have, so you may all have people at home, elderly people who have 60 to 70 percent hearing loss and you go and tell them, look, you know, I think you should have your ears checked. And they say, nothing wrong with me, nothing wrong with me, don't, don't come and bother me. The reason is, the problem about hearing loss is that you only know what you're hearing, you don't know what you're not hearing, only others know what you're not hearing. See, so that's the problem. So it's a very, basically it's a very, you know, subtle uh, infirmity. So in, in children, it can be even more difficult to pick up because they may be, you know, running around, I think, and you don't know whether they're not listening to you or they're not paying attention to you. And children, all children, it doesn't mean downs or anybody, all children have this habit of only listening to what they want to listen. This is what we call selective hearing. It's very convenient. It's what a very convenient hearing. So they can absolutely be, you know, playing around and you tell them, look, you know, please do this, do that, and they'll be just sitting around as if nothing happens. And then you say, well, you know, I'm going to uh, go today and book for a movie, and then they're up and about, you know, they subtly can even whisper, they can hear. So that's convenient hearing. So children can actually be very selective in their hearing. But in Downs, it's a big problem because it's a very subtle hearing loss and this can be very easily masked because the child has some delayed milestones, some very mild intellectual impairment where you're not very sure whether that's the cause for it. And speech delay, is it because of other issues or is it because of hearing loss? So it's a very complicated situation. So you really have to have professional advice and help and not just blame it on, you know, low IQ, mental retardation and so on. So it's, it's, it could be as simple as a hearing loss which is not addressed and we may be missing it for a low IQ or a mental retardation. So all children with Downs must have a hearing screening at birth and then at every six months. In fact, we, we say 0369. Zero is at birth, you have a, have a screening. Three, you have a more formal screening. And that can include more ad advanced audiological tests. At six, you have to intervene. And at nine, you have to intervene and cure the problem. So that's it. So this is the formula that most of us follow. So 0369. Zero, screening at birth. Three, a more advanced screening with more advanced tests. At six, intervene. Maybe a hearing aid, maybe, you know, intervention in the form of... Uh, therapies and so on. At nine, uh, cure the solution. Maybe going for an implant, maybe going for a middle ear implant, maybe going for surgeries to correct the hearing loss, or perforation can be corrected, so on and so forth. At, so, and then by the age of one, the child should be having the same hearing as any other child. So there should be no doubt about it. So these are some simple issues. So this is an eardrum. It looks a little different because this color is subtle, it's a yellowish color. So that's because it's got fluid, it's got straw colored fluid behind the drum. The drum is pearly transparent white. It's one of the most beautiful objects in the body. And because of this fluid, there is a very little hearing loss of about 30%. The audiogram below shows you that. This is the, what we call an airborne gap. So the child has now had drainage of the fluid and a small ventilation tube called a grommet has been put in. It's a very simple procedure which gives instantaneous correction of the hearing problem. On this side is a, 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 what is known as a T-tube which looks like the letter T and the, the horizontal part of the T is in the middle here. The tube is sticking out of the drum. But this stays much longer. It's a long stay grommet. It stays for long. A grommet, this particular grommet in the middle will come out in about three months time. But this T tube will stay for years. So in a chronic problem in the middle ear, a T tube is put, otherwise a small grommet is put. So what are the other issues you can have? You can have problems in the bone, ossicular, ossicles is the middle ear bone, the small bones in the middle ear which connect the drum with the inner ear and they can be eroded and so many other issues which can be more serious. And we may end up sometimes doing a, a more major surgery, a microsurgery to 
clear the infections, to reconstruct the middle ear, to reconstruct the ossicular chain, but they are all safe surgeries, micro surgeries, but safe surgeries. Bone anchored hearing aids are a new development. Now here, what do we do? We know that the skull is a fantastic conductor of sound. So, if there is a lot of issues in the outer ear, in the middle ear, we can bypass all that and give sound directly to the inner ear. And this is done by means of a, a hearing aid, but which is surgically embedded in the skull. So, the sound hits the hearing aid, goes into the skull, and through the skull goes into the inner ear. You are not worried about the outer ear, the middle ear, the ear may be narrow, there may be wax collection, this, that, but you have bypassed all that and given sound directly to the inner ear. This gives very good quality of sound, what we call very high fidelity sound, and these children can, you know, uh, do very well with their ear. Now, here is a situation where there is no hearing at all, profoundly deaf child. This happens in quite a number of children with Downs. Totally no hearing and this is because of the inner ear, it's not the middle ear. Or what we call the cochlea, the inner ear, which is the sense organ of hearing. There are these very fine cells called hair cells. And these hair cells are responsible for our hearing. And they can be easily damaged and if they are gone, they are gone. They are dead, they are dead. They don't regrow, unlike the other cells in the body. So these children can have a profound hearing loss. Hearing aids will not help because if it's a hearing aid, what is a hearing aid? A hearing aid amplifies sound. It's an amplifier. It makes the sound louder and gives it into the ear. But there must be something in the ear to pick up this amplified sound. If there's no hearing at all, no point in amplifying and giving it. So in this situation, we have now come up with what is known as a cochlear implant. And this cochlear implant will then restore the function of the inner ear and give hearing. So investigations are quite a lot. We do quite a lot of investigations for assessing the hearing. We do scans for the ear and then we rule out other syndromes or other associated problems, you know, which are quite common in these children. So hearing aid can be given if there is partial hearing loss. There's some hearing, so I can amplify sound and give it to the ear and the ear can pick up sounds. But if there's no hearing at all, no use in giving a hearing aid, and then we go in for a cochlear implant, which is uh, a, an implant is a device in a set of electrodes which are surgically implanted into the inner ear. It picks up sounds from outside and stimulates the inner ear. The auditory system is, is a miracle. The whole brain, if you see how it works, it's known as organized chaos. It's a bit like India, actually, you know, so organized chaos. But the exception is auditory system. The auditory system is f beautifully fine-tuned, like a huge piano. You have a piano, you strike the notes on the left side, you have a, a low note, a low frequency sound. You go on the right side, you have a high frequency sound. Now the, the inner ear is designed as an ultra piano, as an upside down piano. So in the base of the cochlea you stimulate, you get high frequency sounds. You go to the apex and you stimulate and you get low frequency sounds. So if you play the auditory piano fast, you can give music. If you play it super fast, you can give speech, understanding. So this is how the cochlear implant works. It's a playing the auditory piano in the cochlea. The interesting thing is now we have the same organization throughout the auditory pathway right up to the brain, the auditory brain. So even if the cochlea is not present, we are now putting chips into the brain stem, the basic part of the brain where we have the hearing part called the cochlear nucleus putting it there and giving hearing. So think about it. Technology has reached a stage today where I can now take a child who's got no inner ear, no nerve of hearing, and give hearing. Because I can put a chip in the brain, in the hearing part, stimulate it, and give it hearing. Why is it possible? Because of the organization of the auditory system in the brain. So it's as if God said, okay, I'm giving these ENT surgeons a chance. Okay, let these guys do something about it. So this is it. It's a fabulous arrangement in the brain. So who are the candidates? Severe to profound hearing loss, not benefiting from hearing aids. Simple. So correction of hearing loss in Down syndrome babies greatly reduces the overall burden of habilitation. Yeah, always whenever parents come and they say, I've got a child with multiple handicaps. 
मल्टीपल हैंडी कैप चाइल्ड इज गॉट डाउन द चाइल्ड इज हाइपोटोनिक नॉट एबल टू वॉक मे बी ए बिट ऑफ ऑटिसम नॉट रिस्पॉन्डिंग नो लैंग्वेज नो हियरिंग इज इट वर्थ डूइंग अ कॉक्लेज डॉक्टर से येस बिकॉज इफ यू लुक एट इट ब्रेक इट अप इन टू इट्स कॉम्पोनेंट्स ओके मल्टीपल हैंडी कैप्स डोंट लूज हार्ट ब्रेक इट अप इन टू कॉम्पोनेंट्स इफ यू कैन करेक्ट वन कॉम्पोनेंट द अमाउंट ऑफ हैबिलिटेशन बर्डन बिकम्स लेस दैट मच एंड बिलीव मी प्रोफाउंड हियरिंग लॉस इज अ ह्यूज कॉम्पोनेंट इन एनी हैंडी कैप एंड इफ यू टेक दैट आउट यू डेफिनेटली इम्प्रूव द क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ डेफिनेटली इम्प्रूव द क्वालिटी ऑफ हैबिलिटेशन फॉर दिस बेबीज दे मे नॉट बी singing you cannot compare them with a child who's got no other handicap and only profound hearing loss you can't you can't compare apples with oranges but if you take that baby and see what will happen if i don't do something and then if i do something there's a huge difference so that's how we have to look at it now the next issue that i want to talk about briefly is sleep apnea again it's a very very common problem now this is a the picture of a throat of a baby with downs those are the tonsils that's a soft palate which is hanging in you know and you can see straight away there's hardly any space for this baby that's a tongue so these children have a limitation of space for breathing they snore they snore loudly heroic snoring like adults and even those who do not snore may still have sleep apnea it may be subtle it needs to be evaluated how what is the characteristic these are children who have partial or complete obstruction on the upper airway and almost half to even 100% of down syndrome children in some studies have got sleep apnea and interestingly in pediatric sleep apnea in children who have sleep apnea as they grow older the sleep apnea will become less and less but in downs it seems to become more so that's a difference in downs babies sleep apnea is by no means a, a pediatric problem in fact it's much more common in adults if you take 45 year old men and above be shocked to know that 30% of men above age of 45 have significant sleep apnea okay so if men above 45 here you can all sort of start if you snore and your wife gives you dirty looks in the morning you've got sleep apnea absolutely no doubt about it you know so that's a serious condition a slow killer it's a slow killer it's not to be you know take lightly snoring is a social issue which embarrasses you and then you know disturbs your partner but sleep apnea kills you slowly so take it seriously you know it's not a joke but in downs it's a very serious issue you know it has to be taken very very seriously why do they have it because they have an anatomy which predisposes to sleep apnea they are you know almost uh, you know waiting to develop sleep apnea they have a big tongue they have a narrow space they have large tonsils they have a huge palate so space becomes very less so what are the symptoms they can have they can have nocturnal aneurysms that is they can pass urine in the bed they can have paradoxical movements of the chest and the abdomen they tend to be a little rebellious and aggressive in their behavior in the morning because they not slept well at night you know because sleep apnea they stop breathing they stop breathing they wake up so they shift from deep to light sleep what we call rem sleep is a deep sleep they don't go to it so they come up and then they start breathing again so because of that this chronic sleep deprivation and this you know in the morning they tend to catch up and they do that in adults they tend to doze off you know you're sitting and listening to a lecture you you doze off but in children they become opposite they become more aggressive more rebellious so that's the problem which these children have they can have also attention deficit obviously so already they you know you're thinking about attention deficit this adds on to it in a more much more significant way they become irritable and when you have an obstruction and they start blocking the stomach contents are sucked into the throat and this is known as gastroesophageal reflux a lot of these children will come up with reflux and sleep apnea is a very potent cause of this reflux and of course because of chronic oxygen deprivation two systems are affected two systems are entirely oxygen dependent one is the heart the cardiovascular system the other is the central nervous system both of them suffer it's interesting because oxygen is one of the most toxic molecules in the world in, in the universe but we are oxygen dependent organisms so for us if we don't have oxygen we tend to lose out but oxygen kills a lot of organisms 
That also is true. So basically for us, a central nervous system, the brain and, and as well as the heart are both oxygen dependent and if you start giving chronic deprivation, it has significant repercussions on both these systems. So already these children have a cardiac problem, you know, many of them, and then you are adding on to the strain on the, on the cardiac system. So what are the pointers? Very loud snoring, choking episodes during sleep, mouth breathing, cyanosis or turning blue during sleep, daytime sleepiness, headaches in the morning as they wake up. These are more often seen in elder children or grown-up children. And then during sleep, that's when the baby grows because the growth hormone is released during sleep. And if you don't get good REM sleep, the level of growth hormone release significantly drops. And many of the children have growth retardation and they don't get the full potential. Repeated upper airway infections and then again, because of the reflux, they can have regurgitation or even vomiting during sleep. So what are the reasons for it? Of course, mainly anatomical. You know, they have the short palate, they have hypoplastic mandible and so on. But more important is the, what we call the relative macroglossia. The tongue looks abnormally big in these children, not because the tongue is big, the tongue is the same size, but because the space in the oral cavity is narrow. So it's relative, relative macroglossia. Why is the space narrow? Because the jaw is not fully developed. Both the lower and the upper jaws are not fully developed. So the space in the oral cavity becomes less. So even what is normal in a normal situation becomes abnormal in this situation. It's all relative. So we call it relative macro means large, glossia means tongue, relatively large tongue. There's a general hypotonia. So the muscles are weak, the strength of the muscles is low, and therefore in sleep, this muscles relax even more and it tends to collapse and the airway tends to collapse more. Children tend to be obese and that can add on to the problem and already they have cardiac issues which can add on to the sleep apnea and sleep apnea can add on to the cardiac issues, vice versa. So here is the situation, yeah, I'll be finishing now shortly. So you have large adenoids, the large tonsils and so on. So we need to investigate the children. The most important is what we know as a sleep study. We, we do a sleep study for them, make them sleep overnight and then we assess their, you know, what happens to them during sleep and this gives us a good idea. The uh, sleep study is uh, now a, a standard recommendation on almost all the countries for children with Down syndrome. In, in fact, in 2011 it was added as a, a guideline in the American Academy of Pediatrics also. So they can be managed. They can be managed, that's the important thing. You can maybe operate on them if they have large tonsils or adenoids, you can do various surgeries. You can give them a machine called CPAP, which makes them sleep comfortably. So there's so many possibilities. And very severe children, very, very severe sleep apnea may need a tracheostomy, but that's very, very rare. So cleft palate, again, is a common problem. Chronic sinusitis is very common in children with, with Down syndrome and uh, Gastroesophageal reflux disease, I already told you, is fairly common in these children. So, um, finally, airway, the, the breathing tubes, the trachea, the larynx, these are all floppy in Down syndrome children and they can also obstruct. So, all this, uh, you know, is, are issues in Down syndrome and if you're going to be correcting it, anesthesia also becomes a big challenge in these children. So, all this has to be kept in mind. So finally, I just want to conclude by saying that, uh, you know, Down syndrome babies are very prone for ear problems, ear infections, hearing impairment, sleep apnea, sinus infections and so on. Together, these problems can have a, a very far-reaching consequences for the development of the cognitive development, overall development, as well as the safety of life. And proper evaluation and treatment is very important and we have to be proactive with a very high index of suspicion to ascertain that these issues are sorted out. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Kameshwaran. It's uh, impossible to cover uh, the entire Thanks gamut, but this has been uh, like a big eye-opener and a year-opener for all of us. And uh, take-home message is to do uh, frequent hearing assessments and uh, if a child is lagging behind or is not listening, Need not be because the child is not attentive, but there could be some hearing issues which you should remember. And a lot of important inputs on obstructive sleep apnea. We'll permit uh, one or two questions.
Yeah, please. Barotrauma. Yeah. Barotrauma is, uh, is, is quite an important issue because the eustachian tube in these children can be very narrow, as I already said. So, barotrauma is a, is a trauma which happens or the injury which happens due to pressure variations, like you going in a flight, for example, or if your uh, child is, uh, you know, diving, you know, some children, you know, older children take to diving and so on. Now, the, the important thing is that the eustachian tube has to be open, you know, so that the pressure can be equalized rapidly. And if there is a problem with that, then these children can have middle-ear problems. There are uh, uh, many things you can do, the simplest thing to do. Of course, you know, th there's no use in stuffing cotton into the ear, you know, that's pointless. A lot of people have this habit of stuffing cotton into the ear when they get into the aircraft. It does nothing, so don't do that. Instead, swallow. You know, during the takeoff and particularly during landing, swallow. So in a child, if it's a small baby, give the baby some, some fluid like a milk bottle or something, you know, ask them to suckle. And an adult, give them a, a, a chewing gum or something and ask them to swallow. So the more you swallow, the more the tube opens up. That's a very simple ploy. You can also use nasal decongestant drops. You have medicines which can be given to open up the station tube. These are given usually one hour before the flight. So if a child is prone for that, contact your ENT doctor and then get medicines which can be used one hour prior to the flight and that will safeguard the ear. The mouth, yeah. That's yeah, he's, he's a, a strong candidate for investigation for sleep apnea. So you should uh, approach uh, uh, the, the facility. Which city are you living in? Which city? Hyderabad. Oh, you, you can, there are so many places you can do that. So, you know, investigate uh, for sleep apnea. Uh, check up, do a, what is known as an overnight sleep study. And that will tell you if the sleep apnea is significant. And then you can also find out what is the cause of the sleep apnea and then you can correct it. You must investigate, it's very important. No, no, not a blood test, it's not as a sleep study. That is, the, you'll go and sleep there in the lab. At night, at 9 o'clock, you go to sleep, and at 6 o'clock, you'll come home. And they'll monitor the child during, see how many times the breathing is stopping, what happens to the oxygen level, are there any... Yeah, but you know, see, the, it's just by looking, it's very difficult to say. You really have to have a, what we call a polysomnogram or an overnight sleep study. Only that will tell you for sure. Uh, so, you know, get a sleep study done. Yeah. Pune, Pune, oh yeah, I'm, I'm teen, I'm teen. Pune is a very civilized city, you know, no problem. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she, she, she'll be able to tell you. So just by looking, it's difficult to say that, you know, you have to do a formal study. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah, see, air sickness is a different issue. That's due to the inner ear stimulation. And it happens because of what we call a visual vestibular mismatch. That is, the information coming from the eye...